So tonight I'd like to speak about a topic that is really central to the whole path of awakening and that we've been talking about all along, but maybe not um, exploring in detail. And this is what we could call wholesomeness and skillfulness. So we've been talking about this. Uh, the Pali word is kusala, which is usually translated as wholesome or skillful. And its opposite is akusala. And one of the reasons that um, I think this is important is because both these meanings, wholesome and skillful, have, you know, they're, they're different English words, and yet they refer to the same Pali word. So I think um, it can help us understand what we're aiming for in practice and what the, the Buddhist path is all about. And we often hear that the Buddhist path is all about suffering and the end of suffering. Um, but these two meanings sort of bring out two aspects of that, which we could call, on the one hand, uh, an interest in personal liberation, personal awakening, freedom from the suffering that we experience in our own minds and hearts of greed, aversion, and delusion, and a motivation to be ethical beings in the world. I was thinking as we were sitting, if we were to go around and have people share why they are doing this nine-day retreat, which is uh, can be a challenging thing, probably is challenging for everyone, at least in moments, to be with our own experience in this really direct way. I'm guessing that mostly we would hear uh, responses that are some in some way about this interest in ending suffering for ourselves and maybe also for others. And sometimes we can feel like there's a conflict between these two or we can have arguments about different teachings and feel like maybe some teachings or traditions even are emphasizing our own personal well-being and well, what about taking care of others and feel like there's a conflict there. But as I understand, and a lot of what I'm sharing tonight comes from Gil Fransdahl has a manuscript called the, uh, the Equivalence of Ethics and Enlightenment. Um, and I, and I, I find it a really beautiful um, collection of teachings from the Pali Canon, the, the early Buddhist discourses, and then Gil's commentary on them. But it's really making this point of uh, maybe, maybe the Buddha and early Buddhists didn't see these two aims in, in practice, motivations for our practice, or just these two aspects of our lives, this interest in our own well-being and freedom from suffering and our interest, hopefully we'll have the interest of not causing harm, supporting others, living in harmony, ethically, we could say. So to me, it's a beautiful idea that this path of personal liberation from suffering is also a path, maybe is inextricably and maybe is equivalent to a path of ethical maturation. And I think looking at this word kusala and looking at these meanings of wholesomeness and skillfulness might help us understand why this is the case that we can't really be interested in our own well-being and purifying our own mind from the forces of greed, aversion, and delusion and not have that have uh, wholesome effects, beneficial effects for the people that we're in relationship with. So these two meanings, wholesome and skillful, just they're just two English translations for that word kusala. And 
that word kusala, I believe, is used a lot. So you, you've heard us say skillful and wholesome, I think, a lot during this retreat. So it's really a, a, a central topic. Um, the whole of right effort, which is one of the factors of the Noble Eightfold Path, is defined as uh, cultivating what's skillful and abandoning what's unskillful. And this is really, you know, how we operationalize, you could say, this path is that's really what it's about, is uh, cultivating the conditions for wholesome, onward leading, skillful qualities of mind to arise and to be strengthened and to abandon qualities of mind that aren't helpful. But these two translations have slightly different meanings, but it's interesting that in the Pali, it's one word, so it may, that may be a clue that they're really interrelated, or maybe the early Buddhists saw them as in, uh, inseparable, these meanings. So wholesome has more of the meaning of what's beneficial, what's healthy, what's um, good for us, good for our well-being and good for others and skillful is more has maybe a more ethically neutral meaning in english like you can be skillful at, at any number of things but in the context of um, buddhism it's what's skillful is what's onward leading to achieve the the aim which is liberation from suffering so maybe what's wholesome is what's skillful because that's the whole aim of the Buddhist path. So when we talk about skillfulness and wholesomeness, we're really maybe talking about the same thing, what's onward leading for our own development, for awakening, seeing clearly is also what's beneficial for us. And this makes a lot of sense. I'm sort of spelling it out, but I think it, it's, uh, it's really what helps distinguish what the Buddha's primary aim is, just this very pragmatic, compassionate teaching that this is about suffering and the end of suffering. And even those words, which I, I find that I use a lot when I'm trying to describe the essence of the Buddha's aim, both pragmatic and compassionate, you know, there too, we see kind of this, these two meanings of we're interested in what works, but not just what works in any arena of life. We're interested in what works in the central um, business of liberating ourselves from suffering. Yeah, and I think it's not, it's not rocket science to understand how this personal interest in being free um, can't be separated from how we are in the world. And yet, I think it does, uh, it is a worthy thing to think about because we could have that idea that somehow um, this is a technical matter, like it's about once you follow a certain number of breaths, then you exit from this realm of suffering and are in a realm of pure bliss and you've won the game or whatever, something that somehow can be separated from the qualities in our mind. But as we probably have experienced when we have, say, a kind of striving in our mind, kind of self-centered narrowing of, well, I just want to hold on to this calm it tends to actually, yeah, narrow the mind and constrict it. So I'll explore this as we go along, but I think just, just to start that I find this idea really um, a beautiful understanding of, of the Buddha's teaching, that it was really, it was really not about convincing anyone of anything or starting a religion, uh, or even describing the nature of reality. Um, it's because he was a human being like us and 
uh, through his efforts, through his curiosity, through his deep concern and, and deep honesty with the way things are, you know, this central problem of stress, suffering, unease, not just in himself, but you hear it over and over, you know, this concern with, oh, it's not just me, like this is the world. And it's not just, you know, me in my own little mind here. It's like the greed, aversion and delusion here in this mind. We just have to look at the world at the Buddhist time or now to see how these are not just intrapersonal issues. These qualities get acted out in all sorts of ways that cause real suffering, which feeds into more suffering and conflict. And the Buddha was really interested and talked a lot about that interpersonal nature of suffering and its roots in our own minds. So one way to summarize um, this equivalence of ethics and enlightenment, and I think this is Gill's, um, these, these are Gill's words, but it's, it's sort of a rephrasing of, of uh, a common way of dividing the teachings or the practices in Buddhism into a realm of ethics, a realm of meditation, and a realm of wisdom. But in this, uh, in this rephrasing, it kind of unifies them with this concern with, with harm or with suffering. So avoiding behavior that harms lies at the heart of the Buddha's ethical teaching. Letting go of mental states that harm lies at the heart of the Buddha's meditation teaching. Eliminating the underlying roots of all harming tendencies lies at the heart of the Buddha's wisdom teaching. So just these different layers are more uh, surface and more deep layers of how harm and suffering gets acted out and that deep compassionate concern that that's, that's what we're interested in. So, and I think um, part of my interest too in talking about this is I think a lot of questions that can come up in our practice um, often, you know, the answer from teachers is, I can't tell you, <laughs> is look, look at your own mind and see, see what's wholesome, see what's skillful. And what we mean is see what's leading in the direction of suffering and what's leading in the direction of peace, release. So I think kind of understanding that these are the criteria with which to evaluate our experience to determine what's skillful, what's wholesome, that we have the capacity to uh, distinguish between these. This is really at the heart of practice. Otherwise, we would have no um, bearings on, on what to do, on what, what direction to go in. So it's that growing confidence that we have the capacity, or you could say wisdom has the capacity to distinguish between what's skillful and unskillful that allows us to um, in a lot of cases, um, answer our own questions in the sense of, well, let me see, let me check. I haven't, you know, let me check. What is this, this inclination to want to do this, to want to think this thought, um, to relate to experience in this way? What does that feel like? Does it feel like it's leading in the direction of constriction, suffering, or does it feel like it's leading in the direction of openness, patience, goodwill, letting go. So these are all things that we can see for ourselves, which I think is really important and really empowering and something the Buddha emphasized. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about a particular teaching that's well known, the Kalama Sutta. Um, it arose in a situation where there were uh, a group of people, the Kalamas at the time of the Buddha, and a lot of different spiritual teachers were coming to their town and offering different and conflicting teachings on what, you know, what was important, what the ultimate aims were. And so they were confused, <laughs> like we can be when we hear a lot of teachings, a lot of people with a lot of confidence talking, no, oh, this is the way, just do this, or, you know, 
And so they went to the Buddha and said, we're confused. There's these, all these people with these different conflicting teachings. How are we to know, you know what, what is skillful, what we should follow? And the Buddha uh, first, I don't actually remember which order, but it may be first, but he, he says, first he says what you, you shouldn't go by in basing your decisions on what to believe, on what to trust, what teachings to trust. And this is a kind of a radical, and I think that's why this is a well-known discourse because the Buddha is sort of, yeah, really putting the onus on what we can know for ourselves directly instead of any reliance on external authority. So he says, don't go by oral tradition, a teaching lineage, common talk, scripture, logic, intuition, or reasoning. So not just external authority, but even our own common, you know, logic, thinking things through, which we can have a lot of confidence in, especially maybe in, a, in the modern day, like, you know, if I can just have a clear enough map conceptually, yeah, okay, I remember saying this to Mark <laughs> um, when I was like 18 or something, like, I've read all the books, like, I get it. Suffering, you know, clinging is the cause of suffering, but why am I still suffering? <laughs> so, you know, that that's a limited uh, because it's it's conceptual. It's the kind of seeing that that uh, frees the heart is when we see in our own experience, when wisdom sees in our own experience, this is suffering, this is the cause of suffering. So it's not enough to know it. Conceptually, it, it makes a lot of sense, and that can give us some initial confidence like yeah this 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 makes sense let me check it out so not by don't go by logic intuition or reasoning or by reason of the competence of the speaker you know someone's really well spoken intelligent or because a person is one's own teacher oh that's my teacher i do whatever they say so and i think and he's not saying that these things can't be can't be helpful but that they shouldn't be ultimate, ultimately what we, what we rely on in order to know what, what direction to go in, what teachings to follow. And instead, he gives these five criteria, and the idea is that these we can know for ourselves. So instead, go by what's distinguishing between what's unwholesome and what's wholesome, what's blameworthy or blameless, censured by the wise or praised by them, leading to harm or wealth leading to harm or leading to welfare and conducive to suffering or happiness so all of these the idea is that maybe there's some intrinsic faculties that we have where we can distinguish you know suffering happiness pain pleasure our systems seem pretty well designed to distinguish between those harm and welfare maybe is thinking a little bit further out like long lasting welfare or harm, you know, just a real, yeah, ongoing perhaps harm. Someone's adversely affected by something we might do or say, censured by the wise or praised by them. And Gil, Gil was commenting on this, that it may just arise from our innate sense of wanting to be respected by those that we consider wise. So we would think of that, you know, what would, X do? What would Mark do? What would Shelley do? What would the Buddha do? What would they think? You know, what, what would their perspective be on this? And I'm sure this is, this is a strategy that, that we've used at times in our life when considering different courses of action. Like, what would someone I respect say? I think that's similar to blameworthy or blameless, but, but also Gil was commenting that that could be arise from some intrinsic sense of what's fair you know we may just have i think it's fair to say we we probably do have some innate sense of fairness built in uh i don't know if people have heard these studies they've done with with other primates where it seems like even other primates also have this inbuilt inbuilt sense of fairness it's some experiment where they're giving grapes or something and they give one more than the other and um and they don't like that, and they'll even refuse to, to take the one grape or something like that. I don't remember the details, but, you know, so this too may be something that we don't need to rely on 
an external source to determine what's blameworthy and blameless, but it may be something we can know for ourselves. An unwholesome and wholesome, maybe with that meaning of, of beneficial and um, ethical. So then the next part of the discourse to the Kalamas, the Buddha uh, has them use these criteria to evaluate um, different qualities of mind. So I'll just read a little bit from this. What do you think, Kalamas, when greed arises in people, is it for their welfare or their harm? And they reply, for their harm, Bhante. Bhante means something like venerable sir or something like that. And the Buddha says, Kalamas, greedy people overcome by greed with minds obsessed by it, destroy life, take what is not given, transgress with another's wife and speak falsehood. And they encourage others to do likewise. Will that lead to their harm and suffering for a long time? Yes, Bhante. What do you think, Kalamas? And he repeats this, when hatred arises in people, is it for their welfare or for their harm? For their harm, Bhante. Kalamas, people who are full of hate, overcome by hatred, with minds obsessed by it, destroy life, and they encourage others to do likewise. So he goes on and, and says the same thing for delusion. And then at the end, um, just going through these criteria, are these things wholesome or unwholesome, blameworthy or blameless, censured or praised by the wide, by the wise? Do they lead to harm or suffering or not? And so in this way, the Buddha's um, offering these criteria for the Kalamas to assess for themselves. And it, you know, at least the Kalamas seem to agree with the Buddha that greed, aversion, and delusion lead people to act in harmful ways that then cause more harm and suffering down the line, to act in blameworthy ways and, and so on through those criteria. So this is something that we can check out for ourselves. We don't even have to believe this teaching, <laughs> like the Buddha says, because it's the Buddha. We can check for ourselves, you know, in our own minds, or maybe we can see in others when greed arises in this mind, um, is it for our welfare or, or for our harm? And this is a lot of what practice is, I think. Not just, again, believing anything, because anyone said it, and getting to know what these words refer to in our own experience. I think that's a lot of the maturation of our practice, both kind of along the path of ethical maturation and the path of seeing what supports this mind and heart settling, you know, in a very internal way. Like, what is greed? What is aversion? What is delusion? And this is a lot of what, what we're doing on retreat, because in our ordinary lives, we can be distracted and also influenced just by what's what's normalized by culture, just especially these days, just the frenetic pace, overstimulation, it's like just kind of don't have the the right tool to even assess the different impulses that arise in us just out of habit or what well, yeah, what you know views, ideas that we picked up along our life about what's good, what's, what's appropriate, what's expected. So it's really this checking it out for ourselves um, that's encouraged. But these three, if you haven't caught on yet, are really uh, identified by the Buddha as, as the three roots of suffering. And talked about a lot, greed, aversion, delusion. And the final goal, awakening, liberation from suffering, is often defined, according to Gill, in 44 discourses, Nibbana, so cessation of suffering, is equated to the ending, the uprooting of these three qualities of greed, aversion, and delusion. But it's not always clear what what these are referring to, and the best way again is to look in our own in our own practice. But there there is a a description of some maybe subsets or different words for some for these three qualities. Uh, this is from the 
Dhamma Sangani, which is uh, the first book of the Abhidhamma, which was composed uh, in the early centuries after the Buddha. So I'll just read a few other words for each of these three roots of suffering that may help us identify in our own experience. Because greed, you know, there's all sorts of variations of greed. It can be, you know, super intense or it could just be, you know, less intense, more subtle. So for greed, lobha is the Pali word. We have lust, which is raga in Pali. Uh, then relishing, longing, attachment, clinging, craving. And then hatred, dosa in Pali, wanting to harm, anger, hostility, wrath, malice, irritation, obstructing. I assume that means kind of trying to obstruct somebody, somebody's path. Delusion, moha, ignorance, bewilderment, foolishness, and not knowing suffering, its arising, its cessation, and the practice leading to its cessation. So that's an interesting one. Delusion is not, you could say, not being interested in suffering. Oh, that doesn't matter. I've got other more important things <laughs> to think about. The Buddha said, when you know there is greed, hatred, or delusion within you, and when you know there is no greed, hatred, or delusion within you, then you know the Dharma that is visible here and now, immediate, inviting to be seen for oneself, onward leading, and to be personally realized by the wise. So I think what that evokes for me or reminds me of is that those epithets of the Dharma are, are pretty well known too, and really are pointing to this come check it out for yourself. Like this is something that we, we verify for ourselves and our own experience, visible here and now, immediate, inviting to be seen for oneself, onward leading and personally realized by the wise. And then the Buddha really saying, what we're checking out are, are these qualities in the mind, greed, aversion, delusion, and, and their opposites or their absences. So the tool that we use won't be a surprise either is mindfulness and, and reflection. So there is a, an element of thinking that is involved with evaluating um, the way that our mind is. Um, so not all thinking is bad. Thinking that directs us to our own experience, like really check it out. Like you think that's the case, but you know, investigation so reflection and this ongoing reflectiveness, not just in one moment, but sort of this continual self-reflection. How is the mind? Just, just the very same questions that we're asking in our practice. And I think, you know, as we maybe are nearing the end of the retreat and thoughts of world outside retreat come, it can seem like, oh, that's so different from life on retreat, but from this point of view of, well, what, what can we do to set in motion um, skillful, wholesome qualities and conditions for ourselves and for others, it's really the same kind of ongoing reflection. Is there greed, aversion, or delusion present in the mind that will be relevant here on retreat and off retreat? There's another um, famous discourse, the Buddha talking to his son, who I think was around eight at the time, which is a sweet thing to think about, the Buddha teaching his, his eight-year-old son and what kind of teaching would be accessible to, to a child. And this is also sort of evidence in, in support of this idea that whatever we're, uh, whatever's really central to these, um, this distinguishment between um, wholesome and unwholesome. It's, it's not super complicated. It's, it's an ethical sense that, that we can have access to maybe even as a child. 
but this is a really powerful teaching, I think, uh, in terms of this um, this ongoing reflection around what's wholesome and unwholesome. So I'll read a little bit from it. What do you think, Rahula? What is a mirror for? For reflection, sir. In the same way, Rahula, bodily actions, verbal actions, and mental actions are to be done with repeated reflection. Whenever you want to do a bodily action, you should reflect on it. This bodily action I want to do, would it lead to self-affliction, to the affliction of others, or to both? Would it be an unskillful bodily action with painful consequences, painful results? If on reflection you know that it would lead to self-affliction, to the affliction of others, or to both, it would be an unskillful bodily action with painful consequences, painful results, then any bodily action of that sort is absolutely unfit for you to do. But if on reflection you know that it would not cause affliction, it would be a skillful bodily action with pleasant consequences, pleasant results, then any bodily, bodily action of that sort is fit for you to do. So we, whenever you want to do a bodily action, you should reflect in that way. And then he says the same thing. Whenever you are doing a bodily action, you should reflect, this bodily action I am doing, is it leading to self-affliction and so on? And then also, after the fact, having done a bodily action, you should reflect in the same way. And if it turns out that you did a unskillful bodily action, you should confess it, reveal it, lay it open to the teacher or to an observant companion in the holy life. Having confessed it, you should exercise restraint in the future. But if it was a skillful bodily action, you should stay mentally ref refreshed and joyful, training day and night in skillful qualities. And he says at the end, all contemplatives and Brahmins, Brahmin means noble ones, in the past who purified their bodily, verbal, and mental actions, did it through repeated reflection in just this way. And all wise ones in the future and all wise ones at present purified their bodily, verbal, and mental actions in just this way. So you should train yourself. I will purify my bodily, verbal, mental actions through repeated reflection. So I think there's a lot here, but um, a few things that stand out to me is uh, just that, that before, during, and after, just that kind of thoroughness, because it's not always clear, maybe until, you know, maybe the mindfulness doesn't catch up until, you know, our, we've are, we're already opening the fridge, we're not hungry, but, you know, that will just lead to, um, you know, feeling overly full or something as just one example, or it's sometimes it's not, mindfulness doesn't arise until after, or it's not clear until after an action. Oh, I thought that was skillful. I thought that would, you know, that saying that to my friend would result in, in harmony or happiness, but actually it didn't. So just that opportunity that we always have to be reflecting and learning from our, from our actions. And then the other thing that stands out to me is the, um, and this is common in the suttas and the discourses, but just this highlighting that it's verbal, mental, and physical actions, so that they're, they're all actions. And just to contemplate, you know, we could say the ethics of our mental life. <laughs> you know, how, how often do we bring that kind of uh, integrity just to what we think about? Well, it doesn't matter. It's just in my head, you know, I can think about whatever I want. And we can, but you know, especially on retreat, we see that there's consequences. And that's really, that's really the point. The out of compassion, because we care, we, we, we attend in this way, we, we reflect. I just have a few minutes left, but um, one thing we can reflect on is uh, this whole realm, you know, what, what the consequences are for our actions on any level and, and what are supports for that 
um, that care with that. And there are internal supports and external supports. Um, I think Mark mentioned Hiri and Otapa. The Buddha called them bright guardians of the world. And um, Gil translates them as conscience and discretion. So one is Hiri is more internal, a sense of conscience when we, you know, that's the quality that would arise as we're thinking of what we might do and realizing you know, that would probably be unskillful sense of conscience. And then Otapa is more outwardly focused discretion, like, oh, that could cause harm, you know, not paying attention while I'm driving or whatever that could cause harm. And that, that concern about that. So Hiri, the first is associated with respect for ourselves because we respect ourselves. We don't want to act in ways um, um, that cause harm. And because we respect others, we don't want to cause harm to others. So the whole point is happiness. And um, one of the kinds of happiness, many kinds of happiness talked about by the Buddha, but one that maybe I'll, I'll end with is what's called the bliss of blamelessness, um, which is talked about a lot in the discourses. And um, I'll just read one little, little um, teaching on it. And maybe we can, maybe just even if you've never heard that phrase before, just to think about how we've been living these past eight days, I think probably it's safe to say we, we feel relatively blameless, hopefully, you know, that we're, um, we're not causing harm we're being careful with our actions. Together, we made these commitments at the beginning of the retreat uh, to refrain from causing harm in different ways and from, um, yeah, just being careful with our, with our conduct. So yeah, maybe just that's one thing we can be, be on the lookout for, be aware of this happiness of, of blamelessness, of just feeling like we can look back. Yeah, feel pretty good about how I spent my day. Um, so I'll just read this on the bliss of blamelessness. Knowing the bliss of debtlessness, remembering the bliss of having, partaking of the bliss of partaking, a mortal then sees clearly with discernment. Seeing clearly, the wise one knows both sides that side isn't worth one sixteenth of the bliss of blamelessness. And what I like about this is it's, it's pointing to this as a real happiness that we can experience in our life. And according to this discourse, that is 16 times more satisfying than a lot of the happinesses we tend to orient our lives around having debtlessness, partaking, so just to, this is really the, um, yeah, one, one kind of happiness that arises from this care, this care around what's wholesome. And this whole realm of sila really is, is part of what is related to this conversation. And I won't have time to go into it a lot, but sila often translated as ethics, integrity, morality. But according to Gil Fransdahl, in the earliest discourses has a more narrow meaning of, um, it's always referring to uh, abstentions or um, yeah, abstaining from certain things in our conduct. And why, why would we do that? Why would we you know, not kill and um, so on? Because it's skillful, because it's onward leading in both these ways, uh, being wholesome, purifying our mind and heart, being skillful, leading to, to freedom from suffering. But apparently the Buddha never explicitly directed anyone or instructed anyone to abide by these, which I just think is a, a really interesting point. So no one's telling us, not even the Buddha, that we should behave a certain way. Um, if we, you know, and it's just a question we can ask and probably we've all experimented at different times when are rules of abstention 
of abstaining, refraining from certain activities, when are they useful? And that's, again, the question we should always be asking. When is it useful? When is it skillful, wholesome, onward leading? Maybe because it leads to the bliss of blamelessness, that feeling of feeling good about our actions, which in the discourses is described then as a cause for happiness, real happiness, which then is a really natural cause for the mind settling easily because we feel good. We feel we don't have a, you know, remorse. And then the mind settling leads to being able to see more clearly. So it's kind of a, an ongoing feedback loop. Seen more clearly, we see maybe more subtle levels of greed, aversion, and delusion. And this whole process is just uh, this ongoing movement in the direction of being free from these uh, harmful tendencies. And as we practice, then we are also free from the tendencies, more and more free, weakening the tendencies that to cause harm, that cause harm in the world. So our motivation to practice consciously, we can bring both of these elements in that we're practicing not just for our own welfare, but for the welfare of all. And that's just what I'll end with is um, the Buddha in one discourse said that there, there's people who, who practice or who intend for their own welfare. There's people who intend for others' welfare. But the best is people who intend for both their welfare and for the welfare of others. And uh, I find it an inspiring idea that this can be a motivation for this very seemingly personal work that we do, that it's not just for our own well-being, but for the way we are, the way we are in the world, how we can support others. So let's just let go of the words and sit together for a minute. Thanks for your kind attention. So we have time for walking now and come back at 8.30. Hopefully see you all here for our last sit of the night.